Hey, welcome. Good morning. We're so glad you're here this morning. <laughs> um, we were just discussing, just kind of just giving praise for a few minutes, things that we've, you know, been going through this week, not going through, but enduring birthday parties for grandbabies and <laughs> fights in school. And, that's a joke. Um, I've really been thinking this week. I, I, I want to make sure I'm going to jump right into this, what's really been on my mind. Um, we've been discussing the power of our work for the last few weeks. But there's been a lot of things that I've been sort of just um, rolling around in my mind. I've been thinking about life and life in general. Uh, you know, as a Christian and, and what that entails, what that means, the idea or the picture that we have painted inside of our mind of what church is supposed to look like, what our Christian walk is supposed to look like, what's the point of our lives whatsoever? Is it to... To be in the service of the Most High God and serve and serve and serve. And, and there is truth to that. But in reality of what we're supposed to be doing is being. And you all heard me say that. And that's why I'm sort of reiterating this right now. Is the point of everything is not what work can I do and what can I do. Because God did not create the universe, and then place Adam and Eve in a garden for the purpose of work, 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 work. Now, I'm talking mindset right now. I'm talking, he did say be fruitful and multiply, but the way that Adam and Eve was meant to be fruitful and multiply was to be, to live, to exist, and to exist on a plane where they emulate how God ruled and reigned in heaven. Now, I'm saying all of this, and, and it's easy to sort of slide into that place where you think, okay, well, what's the big deal about that? But we forget, and we forget very quickly. We got sidetracked, live sidetracks. As we, you know, when we woke up this morning, Jennifer said, I do not want to get up. I'm so tired because all week long she's been working on helping prepare and plan for our grandbabies, you know. Um, birthday and helping our daughter and, and doing all these things and, and things that she's proud and glad to do. She wouldn't miss it for the world, but it's easy for that fatigue to sneak up on you. It's easy to be distracted by this and distracted by that. Now, I want you to hold on to that, that thought process or that idea that I'm sharing with you right now because it's the same way with being. And as I mean by being is our Christian walk. What's the point of the church? Why are we to meet? It says to, to you know, it, it says to forsake not the gathering, is what the Word of God says. So why is it important? Does coming to this place together, does that what is that what ensures us going to heaven? No, it's not. But coming together in this place, what it does is it feeds our faith, our spirit, our, you know, our knowing and our knowers that I've got people on this side and that side of me that's doing life <laughs> together with me with a common purpose, which is to be fruitful and multiply. Just as Adam and Eve was meant to spread the garden, that's why God only placed that beautiful, perfect garden in one small section of this earth. They were meant to spread that, to be gardeners, to to exist in order to spread that to every inch of this earth and every planet in the solar system. And to continue to expand throughout the universe. That's the blessing. To have dominion over the fowl of the air, the fish of the sea. To have, you know, to, to be fruitful and multiply. To be. To be on this earth as I am in heaven. Okay? I'm, I'm, I'm pausing on purpose because we need to recognize this. So I'm thinking along these lines. I'm thinking along this this being because we've talked about that a lot. The being, being. If we focus on being who God created us to be, then the doing part is not really even work. It's just it just happens naturally. It's just a natural outcome of being who God created you to be. But it's easy to be distracted from being who God called us to be. 
We've talked for the last few weeks about the power of our words. Why is that important? Is it because it's some sort of magical spell or some sort of formula that works? It's important because that is how our Father, the creator of this entire universe, that's how he operates. That's how he he comes and he goes and he walks to and fro and he speaks it and it becomes so. Light be and light was. Now, what's hard for us to grasp with our, with our finite, our human mind, is that the same power that our Father God possesses in his words is the exact same power that you possess in your words. You hold the power of death and life in your tongue. This isn't a theological idea. It's not a religious idea. It's not a denominational idea. It's the word of God in its purest form. You hold the power of death and life in your tongue. It says you are to be imitators of God. So don't have any shame in stepping into your position as a son or a daughter of God. We talked about this, Jennifer and I, um, and I don't know if I brought it up in church or not. I think I didn't. And I, I should have looked up the, the scripture, but it's very, very um, well known. But it says that he's not coming back for a, a bride. He's coming back for a bride without spot or blemish. Mm -hmm. And what is causing the spots and the blemish in the body of Christ today? This is how I know that he's not coming back today. Because the body of Christ is divided within itself. The body of Christ is devouring one another. Jennifer and I was talking about the Passion Translation this morning. And, and what brought it up was, because we love that translation, and ourselves... And what brought it up was, I was like, man, I wonder what book they're going to come out with next because the whole Bible's not been translated in the Passion Translation yet. But they're, they're saying that by 2028, the entire Bible will be translated in the Passion Translation. So I'm looking up, you know, on my phone this morning, sitting there, when's the next book to come out? Having a hard time finding it. But when I pull up the Passion Translation, I get a barrage of, why it's not of God, and they're not this, and they shouldn't be doing that, and attacking this. So then Jennifer and I start a uh, discussion and a conversation, and we say, you know, Jennifer said, well, how, what's the method that he's translating the Bible? Brian Simmons, I believe is the, the gentleman's name, him and his wife. That, is that what I told you, Brian Simmons? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he's the lead translator of the Passion Translation. Now, I don't want to get off on this, but I'm painting a picture here. That him and his wife, he received through an absolute miraculous, you know, encounter with God in 1971, he received Christ in his heart. He had three children, okay, and he, through the, the leading of the Holy Spirit, took his wife and three children, sold everything, and moved to the jungles of Central America. And he started to reach out to the indigenous people and the people that, that knew nothing of God. And he translated the Bible into their dialect. Okay? Spent years there with his children. You talk about leaving everything. You know, sometimes we, we look at other households and we think, man, you know, as kids, we think, man, they got all this and I don't have nothing, da-da-da. Let me tell you something. Compared to the majority of the world, you've got a lot. Yeah. And I'm talking to me too, not just the teenagers, I'm talking to me as well. Is <laughs> it's easy because all we know is what we see, right? All we know is what we see by the lake. All we know is what we see, you know, coming down the road and around this town and whatnot, and there's restaurants on every corner and there's all of these things and 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 you know, and, and I'm not gonna fall into oh Americans are spoiled. I've read books that that basically paint a picture. You should be ashamed that you have all these things. You should break down into a, you know, just sell everything off and just live as humble as you can and have nothing and suffer for God. Well, that's a lie. That's a lie in the other direction because God did not create you to be one that is sitting on the sidewalk with his little tin cup and arms, 
Arms for the poor, that's me, arms. If I could just get a few nickels, I could, oh wait, nickels ain't gonna buy no bread. If I could just get a hundred dollar bill, I could buy me a loaf of bread. You have to constantly be on guard. Your mind, which is your soul, your spirit, and your body, you have to be on guard and constantly thinking about pressing forward. I'm talking to me. I'm weird like this. This week, I purposely took, because uh, I love music, I took some different songs and whatnot that I stumbled across, and I would listen to it, and I would, I would literally feel my very mood, my mindset change. Mm -hmm. And not always in a good way. And I did that on purpose. Now, I'm not telling you to go do that, because that's probably a dumb thing to do. <laughs> but I get curious about things. You know? Back to Brian. Let me finish up Brian Simmons. So Brian Simmons, he moved his family back to America, okay? And he started, he planted churches in Central America and whatnot. He moves back here, and he's, he's very familiar and educated in Greek, Hebrew, and the Aramaic languages. So what his purpose and goal was, was for you to be able to look at this Bible that he translated, the, the Passion Translation, okay? Now, I'm not just babbling. I'm saying this because I want people that hear my voice know where I stand about this translation. I love the Word of God, and I love different angles of the Word of God. I'm going to say something different than somebody from Ohio or New York or you know, Minnesota, I'm going to say something that comes from a different angle, but it's going to the same destination. Now, don't take me wrong. I'm not saying that all, all vers versions are good and okay and whatnot, but spit out the, the sticks with the straw. Have enough spiritual maturity about yourself to be able to see what settles in your spirit. That's my point. Because what he did is he wants to speak with the literal translation of the word, the Aramaic, the, the Hebrew, and the Greek versions. And he wants to paint a picture where it ignites a fire inside of you where when you hear the word love, it's not just, oh, oh, oh I love you, Jennifer. Oh, I just get tingles all over me when I love you. It paints a picture of a deep love that no matter what she's done to hurt me, I still love her. No matter what what slip or, or you know snafu I might have said, that even though it, it might be something that's not exactly you know um, the right thing to say, because I've been known to not say the right thing. But she sees past that, and that's the type of love that God loves us with. We have in our mind that God bases His view on us on if we are good or bad. We have in our mind that God sees us and because we messed up or because we said that cuss word, because we slipped up and we and we got drunk. Or we, you know, we 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 did whatever it might be, whatever we know is not right, not of God, that all of a sudden God is like, I'm so mad at you, and I don't have nothing to do with you. He still loved you. He said, when you were yet sinners, he sent his son to die. For you, even though you are filthy and rotten and no good with no redeeming qualities about yourself, Jesus came and he died for you. So, does that mean that just go and do whatever you want? Or is that old, that, that flip side of the grace message, right? Well, that grace message, it just gives you a ticket to sin. No, it don't. Grace does not give you a ticket to sin, but grace does make it to where when you did sin, it's not lights out for you and it's over for you. I give up on you. He said, I will never leave you and I'll never. I want you to think about that, okay? That's a scripture we've all heard a million times, right? Mm -hmm. He says, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. God said, I will never leave you. He could say it this way. All right? KSV, the Kent Sabbath version. No matter what you do, I'm never going to leave you. No matter what you said, I'm never going to leave you. We were watching a show the other night, a reality show that we watch, 
and whatnot, and uh, you know, and times are hard in this. I don't care, it's Survivor. And this guy, he's all the time. He's he's a terrible at the game. He's horrible. And he's he's no good at playing the game. He's terrible at it. He can't lie for nothing. I'm a pastor, but let me tell you something. If I was on that show, I would look at somebody in the face and I would say, Reed. You're my number one. I tell you what, I think that we can go the whole way because ain't nobody has this game like we do, right? Let's vote her off. I'd cut your throat so quick your head would roll down the hill. But he don't understand. He don't understand that the, the concept of of uh, the game, right? So this guy, he's he's all the time praying. And he's, he's of a, a, I don't know if he's a Christian or not, but he, he calls out to God. But he's all, oh, help me, help me, help me. And he should be said, help me because I'm too stupid. I'm no good at this game. And God don't care about survival. He don't care about a game, all right? That's the point. But here's the thing is this dude is pressed so far in his emotions because of his own silliness that he gets mad. He God, why did you even bring me here? Oh, God. <laughs> I don't remember. There's been many times I've thought about applying for Survivor. <laughs> I don't remember Jeff ever walking up and saying, hey, God just handed me your phone. He dialed the number. <laughs> All right, that's funny, but here's the point, is how many of us have got mad at God and yelled at God? Why did you do this? You don't have to raise your hand. I'll raise my hand for you. Why did you let this happen? Why did you? God said that even though you're a numbskull and you say stupid things like that, I know you don't really mean it and I love you that much. But I will never leave. I love you so much that the most precious thing in all of the known and unknown universe, my son, I'm going to give him as a perfect spotless lamb for you. So we have to constantly be on guard for our mind, our spirit, and our body. You know, and it happens to script, you know, in, and I, I looked it up, in the Song of Solomon 2.15, it's where it talks about the little foxes full of the vine. Okay? It's discreet, and it's quick. It's the little distractions in our life. And I, I, I'm, I'm enduring these things in my life. I've been very transparent. There's things that I'm very unhappy with in my life, and it feels like that there's not enough minutes in the day to accomplish the things that I want to accomplish. It feels like that I'm constantly, just a time drain on my life is getting sucked out of me to where the things that I want to do, I, is it okay if I'm being real? I mean, is this okay if your pastor is just bearing his heart? Of, of what, and I'm not crying about this because I'm seeing it and I'm evaluating what this is and what to do about it. So this isn't me crying, oh God, help me. I'm taking responsibility for me. But I'm sharing with you what I'm thinking and what I'm going through. Okay? So, when I find myself getting sucked, my time sucked away by the things that I have no desire to give my time to, but I have to because it's a job. And it's many hours and all of these things. And then all of a sudden, when there's not another minute for me to give to the things I want to give to, then depression tries to sneak in. And failure, that, that, that thought of failure and that, and that you're no good and you'll never, hopelessness, right? You'll never be able to get to the place that somewhere, once upon a time in your heart, I know I'm supposed to be in that place, but now that place has become dark and a shadow fell over it, and you see no way of getting to that place. And you're missing stuff with the people that you love more than anything. And then you come in and you're so tired that you're sitting there for 30 minutes and your daughter says, Daddy, are you about to go to bed? Because I'm sitting there falling asleep just sitting there because I'm wore out. And guilt comes in because I can't keep my eyes open for another minute. Now, I don't know, y'all. Maybe that's just me. But is that the life that we were meant to live? So when it all seems hopeless and you feel helpless, what do you do? 
You've got a choice. Either you just fold up and you, you know, oh, man, I just, ain't nothing I can do. I'll just give up. Because I'm telling you, I'm not going to give up. This is going to sound crazy to all you bodybuilders in this room. But the thing that I love doing, that I enjoy doing, is lifting weights. I enjoy that, and I love that. And I was setting my alarm for 3 o'clock in the morning so that I could go do that before work, and it didn't take away from my time with my girls. Last week, I got up one time because I could not drag my tired behind out of that bed. I am telling you, I, I, I just, so what happens is not only the whole Christian side of it, but the natural side of it to where I'm fat and I need to not be fat, and I don't feel good because I'm too fat, and I'm, you know, and I'm down on myself because, oh, I did it again, I didn't get up, and I knew I should have got up, but, you know, that Jennifer, all it takes for her to just reach over and just lay her hand on my arm, and I ain't going nowhere. <laughs> and the excuses well up. <clears throat> There's a purpose of me saying this, is that everybody sometime or another faces a time like that. You know what we hate? Because we went through such a time for years. I hate the statement, it's just a season. Does that bring any sort of hope to you when you hear this a season? It makes me mad. And I, and I know people are trying to be helpful. I'm not saying that. You know, it's the little foxes. I've got a friend. I'm going to tell a story. I've got a friend that I've known for many, 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 many years, okay? And he had a moral failure. A pastor. Been very successful. A beautiful wife. Beautiful children. I know all of them. And had a failure. This dude, you'd have never dreamed that it would ever happen to him. So you know what I did? For two weeks solid, I chewed on it because here's the thing. Fortunate or unfortunate, I carry things like that. And when I called him, I didn't say... Why did you do that? I texted him first, are you free for a call? And later he told me, he's like, I knew that's why you were calling. Because it happened some time ago, and a lot of people didn't know for a long time, but I mean, the everything happened. And Anyway, the first thing I said to him when he answered the call was, are you okay? When a man falls like that, or a woman, you know what I mean. When a person falls like that, what's our natural instinct? Why would they do that? <clears throat> Listen, it can happen to anybody. Mm -hmm. So what I have to do as a pastor is not put myself in a position for that to be able to happen. There's not words to express how much I love my wife. I look at my wife and I just think, she is way prettier than me. I did good. She is the mother of my children. She is literally my best friend. There's, I think about it and, I, and I'm had so many friends over the years, good and bad friends, and whatnot. And I was thinking about this just yesterday. I was thinking, you know, there's not a time where I just wish, man, I wish I could have some time away from Jennifer. Now, she would not say the same thing because <laughs> I am a constant, you know, roller coaster of, I mean, roller coasters are cool and all, but after a while it sort of gets, ugh, you know, you got to take a breath, right? So, <laughs> she's my best friend. So when you enter into that part of life, it's so much more than just, hey, baby. You know? It's so much more. I'm being real. 
Mm-hmm. It's so much more than, you know, there's nobody I'd rather be with. I, I mean, it's not a joke to me. These two people sitting right here are my very best friends. They're my best friends, and there's nobody in the whole world I'd rather be with than them. Spending my time, you know, I'm hard to live with, Caleb. I am because I am, whew, I'm at a 10 <laughs> most of the time. But it's the way my mind is, you know. We was watching another stupid show, and this woman, she just takes every opportunity she can to say, I'm autistic, I'm autistic. You don't sound autistic. You sound like a moron just pointing out that you're autistic. Now, I'm not against people I'm mean, dealing with autism and stuff like that. I'm just saying I'm, I think it's dumb when people are just trying to find something to have. We knew a little girl that once said, I'm agoraphobic. And it made us mad. Just because she wanted to be something. That's dumb. We'll get off that. I'm going to start now with my notes. How's that? We have to take... Here, I'm going to move it right here. Right. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 10. Okay? Y'all are going to be so proud of me because I've been trying to quote the scripture for weeks. I five out of it. 2 Corinthians 10. Starting in verse 3. It says, Though we walk in the flesh, we do not... War according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, <coughs> casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought, oh, there it is, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. There is so much in that passage right there. There's so much inside of there that would battle not against flesh and blood. I was just talking about all the things that I'm enduring, right? All the things that I'm facing right now, what's the answer? That was a question I asked. What's the answer when you feel helpless, hopeless in that dark place that you don't know how to find your way out? You can't, you forgot what you was even dreaming about? The battle is not flesh and carnal in front of you, but it's against principalities and powers of darkness. That's Ephesians 6. Matter of fact, let's go to Ephesians 6, because it goes right alongside uh, 2 Corinthians 10, okay? Ephesians 6 says it this way right here. It says, uh, starting in verse 10, it says, Finally, my brother, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities powers against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. All right, Daniel prayed, right? Let's flow for just a few minutes, and I'll let y'all go have your Sunday lunch, and I'll start working on a kitchen faucet. How's that? Daniel prayed for 21 days, and when the answer finally came, the angel said, I started this way, and I'm paraphrasing, I started this way on the first day that you prayed. He said, but I had to battle against the prince of Persia, which is the unseen demonic entities of this realm, right? Well, not this realm, but the unseen realm. He said, I had the scroll with the answer straight from the mouth of the father sitting on the throne. He said, but I had to fight a battle in a, in a war that you can't see that's raging all around us in the unseen world. That's why it's important your prayer, praying in the Spirit. And I feel like that when you begin to pray in the Spirit, you can't see these unseen entities. Angels, demons alike. You can't see them with your natural eyes. But when you begin to pray in the Spirit, you begin to empower and bring uplifting power and support in that warfare to where it opens up lanes for you to receive the Word from God. Let that sink in a minute. When you are taking your part in an unseen war and you're praying in the Spirit, you're bringing to that forefront a weapon that the enemy don't know what to do with. That it opens the path for you to receive from God because as you pray in the Spirit, it says that the Holy Spirit makes groans and utterances 
on your behalf. And when your spirit man receives that word, it will rise up into your mind or that's when it's been birthed into the natural. It's going from the spirit world into the natural world to where you then know what to do with your life. It don't matter if you're 10 years old. It don't matter if you're 74 years old. You have the power and the authority and the tool, the gift of God to utilize praying in the Spirit. Because you're not battling against the things in, the, in this world. What do it say in, in, in Hebrews 11? It says that the things of the world, in verse 3, says all things of this world were birthed from the unseen world. Now I'm paraphrasing and KSV in it like nobody's business. But that's what it says. We talk about that all the time, right? We have to have that same attitude and that same, that same thought process in this. Is that all right, I see an issue in front of me in this natural world, and the answer has to come from the supernatural world. How do I get it from the supernatural to the natural? Through my words. Your words are the conduit that releases those things on your behalf in the seen world. Bill Weston said, I took all my bills and I laid them out on the counter. And then Veronica, his wife, said, we pointed at those bills and we said, bills, in the name of Jesus, I call you paid off. Now, I want any one of you to tell me what kind of sense that makes to your natural mind. Drink. I call you drunk. <laughs> They're still drinking in that, in that cup, by the way. That's a silly example, but it's just as real as looking at a pile of paper saying, you're paid off. But guess what? God begins to put things in motion through spiritual law, not natural law, to where the finances will come. He said, give and it shall be given unto you. Pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give into your bosom. He, your conduit is your words. His conduit is using others to sow into you. To make a way where naturally there would be no way. It don't have to make sense to you because if it makes sense to you, then it wouldn't be faith. The only thing that needs to make sense to you is by faith. The worlds were constructed. By faith, we please God. By faith, we are the identity of Christ in God. By faith, we receive salvation. By faith, we live up to the standard that he created us to live. All right, so Ephesians 6. Let's break it down real quick. Ready? Because this is awesome. And, uh, and 6 says that we're not battling against things that we see, but we're battling. I want you to, to shift your viewpoint to a spiritual viewpoint to where you are fighting against the things, just like Daniel, that are trying to stop the answer and the outcome that God insisted for you to come to pass. So in verse uh, 13, it says, Take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the evil day and having done all to stand. When you feel like you can't stand anymore, do all to stand. I will confess to you. I sat on that floor over there so aggravated the other day, just defeated because I couldn't get a simple thing done. And I looked at Jennifer and I said, I'm about to crack. I was at that point to where, I mean, I was absolutely about to just tear this whole house down. Piece by piece. But it says the, that we have to stand. When we've done all to stand, stand. Stand therefore having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. We've all heard this, right? Having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, which you will, will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Oh, yeah. And for me, 
that utterance may be given to me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains that I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. All right, we've all heard it, right? The whole word of God. The belt of, the belt of truth. We've heard the shoes of the gospel of it, the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation. What happens when you stop and you meditate on the pieces of the armor? I'm going to go quick, all right, because I, I got carried away with the other stuff. I just flow with the Holy Spirit, all right? So we know that the waist, which is your core, what happens if your core is weak? Your back's hurt, you're broke down, you, you, know, you, can't, you can't cut your waist off. Just like that's what's wrong with a migraine and a headache or a toothache. You can't cut your head off, right? It's part of your body. But it says that when you're rooted and your, your support is the truth, right? Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And before he was God the Son on this earth, in the heaven he was God the Word. So when you are supported and rooted in the Word, and this is the very core of who you are is the Word. I'm not moved by what I see. I'm not moved by what I hear. I'm not moved by what I feel, but only by what the Word of God says. We have to convince ourselves, this. you've heard me say it. You've heard me say it. And when you're sitting in the middle of the floor and you're saying, I'm about to crack, at that point, you've got to do something. You've got to return back to the Word or be defeated. Hey, I'm not pointing fingers at you. I'm pointing fingers at me. You have a choice at that point. Am I going to believe the Word and the whole Word or not? The breastplate of righteousness. You are the righteousness of Christ, of, of, of God in Christ. I want to use the right... You are his righteousness. When it talks about righteousness, it says you are you. That's the being. Be who I made you to be. Be who I created you to be. You are my righteousness. You represent my righteousness. You are who I am. It says in, in um, 2 Corinthians 5, we know that in 17 it says that all things have passed away. All things have become new. Old things passed away. All things are new. Verse 21 says that you are the righteousness of God in Christ. It's like wearing a name tag that says, Hello, my name is God's righteousness. Hello, my name is the righteousness of Christ. Hello, my name is righteous. That's who I am. That's who he created me to be. And that breastplate, that breastplate, what does it protect? Let's think natural for a minute. What's the breastplate? Can, it, 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 it protects your heart, mm -hmm. the spirit, the you. And the more you know who you are, the stronger you will be because then it brings a whole new meaning to no weapon formed against me can prosper. Because I am in unity with Christ. It's in him that I live. It's in him that I breathe. It's in him that I have my being. And we have to hold fast to our confession and the word of God and remind ourselves when the attacks come in in every direction, we begin to declare and speak the word of God to fight back against the attacks. I'm about to crack was the wrong response. The right response is that the mind of Christ is in me and I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That he provides my every need according to his riches and glory that no weapon formed against me shall prosper. I am mighty through God for the pulling down the strongholds. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. I am an overcomer. I'm more than a conqueror. I am a child. I am his beloved. I'm the apple of his eye. I am the one that he sent Jesus to die for. He left the 99 to come get me. And that is spiritual warfare. Am I yelling at you? No, I'm just being passionate. Listen. Let me just put something to rest right now. This is my house. I can yell if I want to. <laughs> that breastplate protects the real you. The spirit. Okay? 
your shoes. It says the gospel of peace. The gospel is the good news. The gospel isn't for God so loved the world that again it is, but it's not limited to this. See, that's where so many in the body are missing it. This isn't an attack. This is sad because so many people don't even know what they know, right? They don't even know what they've heard. They only they don't seek more revelation because they've been told this is all the revelation there is. Is that you cry out to Jesus because you're a sinful, filthy, no good, low down piece of trash, and that you know Jesus decided to come and die for you, and you know you better count yourself as lucky. Now hold on for the ride, just get the darn crap kicked out of you until Jesus comes back. That'll prove that you're really a Christian. But the good news is everybody in this room saved? I'm saved. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm saved. <laughs> so, why do I need to hear if the good news is just about getting saved? Why do I need to hear that message? But, I've got a pile of bills sitting right over there. That provision message. I need to hear that. I got people in my family that suffer with sickness. What message do they need to hear? They're saved. They've received salvation. Do they need to, you know, if they're if they've got cancer, do you need to go to somebody that's died from cancer, it's a Christian, and say, and the Lord says, if you call upon him, he will save you and you'll get to go to heaven. You need to go and say, the Lord says, that by his stripes you're healed. Jesus said that I took the sickness and the disease so that you don't have to be plagued by those things. Jesus, which had a money carrier, he had a treasurer that traveled around with him that would steal from him all the time, and he had so much in that money pouch that they didn't realize he was getting stole from him. And they aren't there thinking, man... I knew I had another $5 bill in there somewhere. They had such abundance that it wasn't even missed. And I'm sure Jesus had a clue. <laughs> Jesus, he, he, he's pretty sharp. My big brother, he's sharp. He knows stuff. <laughs> but when you're sitting there and you're thinking, oh my God, how? Because the economy is the way it is. How am I going to feed my kids this next week? Man, that snow that snowstorm came and it knocked me out of work for you know for a week and a half and you know and over seventy percent of the nation, over seventy percent is living paycheck to paycheck. But that shouldn't matter to us. I make that statement in faith. Yeah. That shouldn't matter to us. Yeah. Because I see my bank account. And I see that check that comes in each week. And I see it and I think, man, how are we going to... But in all reality, this ain't me bragging on me. This is the decision I made. We're talking about I have to go buy another faucet for the, the thing this morning. You know, after we get off work. Or not work. Not work. <laughs> And Jennifer said, it don't matter. I said, you want to go to Home Depot or Lowe's? And she said, it don't matter. It'll probably be $100 to the place. And I said, well, I said, like 50 And then I made this statement. I said, I don't care how much it is. That is against our natural thought. Because what's our, you know, what's our, you know, our, our duty? And to be respectful and you know, and, and really, we should, oh, we should count every penny and think, oh, you know, I better make the best and stretch every penny. And I'm not saying go squander everything and just whatever. But you know what makes me know I'm doing a good job? I'm going to tell my daughter. Is after her ball game the other night, she went and ate with her teammates and whatnot, and a couple of coaches was there. And Kenley... There's one girl in particular on her team that she really likes. They've made good friends. And Kenley said, I'm going to pay for her, her meal. You know? Hmm. They don't stop there because, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm raising our kid to be a giver. 
Right. And you had a couple of girls that's, you know, being rude and whatnot. Anyway, and kids are kids, right? Not whatever. All they know is what they see or, you know. I mean, teenagers are, they don't always mean what they're saying. They're just trying to get attention. Especially weird girls. <laughs> Kenley left the waitress a $20 tip. Who do you see you give tips? Mom and dad, right? Mm -hmm. There's been times that we've left a $100 tip mm -hmm. that far exceeded even what we paid for our meal. I'm not bragging about that. I'm saying that we're sowing seed in our daughter. Let me tell you something else. Even a couple of her coaches have said, oh, no, 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 that's too much. That's too much. And Kenley basically just said, no, you know, she's working and I want to, you know, she's working for her money and I want to bless her. Now, she might not have said those exact words, but that's in essence, right? Mm -hmm. And didn't back down. And you know what the word of God says? I done mentioned it once in Luke 6. It says, give and it shall be given unto you. Pressed down, shaking together, running over, shall men give into your bosom. So Kenley sowed seed where she didn't have to sow seed. Mm -hmm. That waitress didn't expect her to sow seed. In Galatians, it says, if you sow sparingly, you will reap sparingly. But if you sow bountifully, you shall also reap bountifully. And that we should expect that. 30, 60, 100 fold return. Why is it shameful to simply expect what God said in his word? We have to adhere to the gospel, the good news. Okay. That is, the gospel is your title deed that grants you victory, not in just one area, or you get to pick your area, he told Solomon, God said, choose. Do you want riches? Do you want fame? And Solomon said, I want wisdom. Revelation. And God said, you choose wisely. And because you choose revelation, he said, I'm going to give you all of it. He told Abraham, I said, I will make you a great nation. And, and what does that do with us? That's Abraham, Right? But it says that when you asked Jesus to come into your heart, you became an heir. You are of the seed of Abraham. That means that title deed has passed to you to where he says, I will make you a great nation. I will take you places that you never imagined that you could go. But all you have to do is seek me. Seek me first and my kingdom my viewpoint, the way that I look at things and I operate. He says, and I take care of all the details. I will take care of every bill. I will take care of every auto, you know, in issue, whatever it may be. Jesse said that his, uh, Jesse the I mean, I'll drop names. I don't care. If it works, it works. His air conditioning guy, his hitting an air guy, he said, man, I love you, brother Jesse, but I sure do hate working for you. He said, because your stuff never wears out. <laughs> Ever. It don't wear out. It don't make sense to the natural, but we live by supernatural law that supersedes. What's supernatural? That's above the natural, right? Mm -hmm. The extraordinary. The extraordinary. So therefore, our supernatural mm -hmm. law that we're literally bound to, if we acknowledge that, it supersedes, it oversees and is above and ranked above the natural law. Oh, I'm talking so to let it sink in. These are, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm like, what I'm doing, I'm taking so much stuff, I'm just throwing it on here. So much, we have to just tread through this stuff. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hurry it. We can go through it more and more and more. That's all right. It's all right. The shield of faith, all right? Let's go to that. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Hebrews 11, 6. We know that. That shield of faith, it says it quenches every fiery dart. It doesn't matter. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. We are mighty through God. It says whatever comes at you, you're already victorious. All right? Helmet 
covenant of salvation, you have to know your place. Except the title deed that I was just speaking of, it also protects your soul. And your soul is not this. That's your spirit. It's not interchangeable. Your soul is this. It's your mind, your will, and your emotions. Get a hold of that because if you get a hold of that, then you're going to know more than a big majority of the, tr the church. Your soul is your mind, will, and emotions. And in 3 John 2, it says, Beloved, I would have you to prosper as your soul prospers. In Proverbs, it says, As a man thinks in his heart, so shall he be. As you think. So what that means is who you decide to be is who you are. Either you decide to be conquered and poor and no good and dumb, or you decide to be an heir of the Most High God, that you have the mind of Christ. You have the ability to carry out the purpose that he placed inside of you. But first you have to decide that's you. In Ephesians 5 it says, it talks about how do you do these things. You wash your mind in the water of the Lord. In Ephesians 5, and this is one of my favorite scriptures, um, 25, yeah, 25, it says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. And I take that as a challenge because I love my wife. But in verse 26 it says, Washing with the water of the Word. So what does that mean? That means taking the Word... And applying it to my mind to where my viewpoint isn't the natural viewpoint of go cook my lunch. Now, she does do that. She does great. She makes some mean eggs for me. I eat eggs all week. But it says to wash your mind with the water of the word. That means that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. That's feeding your spirit, but it's also, it's a dual effect because when you hear the word and you speak the word and you meditate on the word, it becomes ingrained in your mind where this and this becomes connected and you become a whole person because this is going to fall in line with these things. This don't have a mind of its own. The mind of this is sitting in my skull, and this needs to be ruled by the word, which is controlled by the God, the real me inside. And it all ties together. The try being of a human. Man, you should see the real me, the spirit me. It don't matter if I skip a few days working there or not. I am absolutely jacked. And I'm not some little skinny little, you know, poo butt sissy guy. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm like a darn bulldozer. No fat. And I'm just, man, God's like, man, that dude right there, he's, man, Goliath was shivers in him. Woo. That ain't no little David. That's Kent. Woo. And Goliath said, whoa, never mind, sucker. Here, here, take my spear. Break my head. You know what? Here. <laughs> Don't do it. I'll do it for you. B. And that's sort of the spirit. Let me finish right here, okay, y'all? And thank you for bearing with me. I kind of went on a trip. The sword of the spirit. In Hebrews 4, it says that it's sharper than any two-edged sword. We all know that scripture. But you know what jumped out at me? A million times here in that scripture. It says dividing soul from spirit. And we just said that soul and spirit are two different parts of you. So that word, it divides your thoughts and your imaginations of what is natural thought. And what it does, it digs into your supernatural knowing. It cuts away the natural thought. It don't, it darn shins it away. And it digs into your supernatural knowing where that begins to flow up into what's now your common sense. Well, common sense tells us we should, no, no, no. That's no religious garbage pile. Common sense should tell you that if the word of God says it, then that's what you do. Don't put boundaries on your God-given right to be. You meditate on that word, Joshua 1, 8. The sword of the Spirit is the only offensive weapon mentioned in Ephesians 6. All the rest of them is to defend you and to protect 
vital parts of your being. But the sword is the only offensive weapon. So how do you use the sword? We go right back to Isaiah 55, 11, where my word goes out. It'll never return void. It comes back with blood stains from the enemy. Well, I love the KSV. It's one of my favorite Bible verse, scriptures. <laughs> when my word goes out, it cuts the head off of Goliath. When my word goes out, it clears the path for the convoy marching in for victory. Man, and just like David, oh, y'all, y'all, about the right guy or the wrong guy, whichever way you want to look at it. This imagination that goes on inside of this guy, talking about a dreamer, I can see David dancing. And you know, true, true dancing for the Lord and, and worshiping God is ugly dancing. <laughs> And man, when you're in that spot and you're praising God and you forget that Reagan might be sitting there laughing at you. Because I don't care. She'd probably dance with you. Because just like, just like as David came in and he danced and his darn goofy wife and calls, she said, you are a king and you look like a fool. And David said, ha, ha, ha. Well, and you ain't seen nothing yet. And he stripped down to his darn skin kiss and he gave it some ugly dancing. He praised God with everything inside of him. Because nothing else mattered. Because he abides, he lives in the praise of his people. And if we live in that place of praising God, the details fall to the side. Because when God is for you, who can be against you? Amen. 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 That's right. Thank y'all for going on a trip with me. You got anything to add? No, I love. No. Get ready. The devil thought he had me whipped. I'm looking at that camera right now. The devil thought he had me whipped, but I will never stop. As long as there's breath coming in, in my lungs, because I was reminded this yesterday. The Holy Spirit said, What did you tell me on August 19th, 2001? Mm -hmm. I told him, I said, if you give me strength to stand up, and I'm laying face down on the floor, so if you, as long as you give me strength to stand up, I said, I will. You won't be able to hide from me. I said, as long as there's air coming in out of my lungs, I will tell people about Jesus. I said, if I have to sweep floors to tell somebody about Jesus and the goodness of God, Lord, just put the broom in my hand. And every one of y'all are just as good, if not better, than me. I'm here to tell you on a natural side and possibilities and opportunities to, to be. So don't sell yourself short. Suit up with that whole armor. Meditate on what that means. Because I just gave y'all some nuggets this morning about what each piece of that armor is. And then draw your sword and come back with the blood of the enemy. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. I bless y'all. I love y'all. Lord, let this seed take deep root inside of our spirit and allow us to be different from this moment moving forward. Lord, let the vision that you've given each of us for our lives, not only ministerially, but, but you know, or professionally, but personally, let it be very clear. Let us be able to write down that vision and make it clear so that we can follow out the plans and purposes you've laid before us. We love you and we praise you, Lord, and we honor you. Allow us to honor you with all we say and all we do. Allow us to tame our tongues. Allow us to speak life. Allow us to speak death against the attacks of the enemy. But, Lord, above all, allow us to be who you created us to be. Yeah. I love you and I praise you, Father. Amen. We look forward to seeing you next time. If you, wanna, if you want to have a, oh, a you know, no. just a remissionchurch.com. Give us your testimonies. Give us your prayer requests. If you want to sow good seed into good ground, there's a giving tab, missionchurch.com. We look forward to seeing it. We love you guys. Wow.